Hello and welcome to episode 37 of the Sockmetician podcast. My name is Nathan Taylor, also known as Sockmetician here on YouTube, also on Ravelry, Instagram, Twitter and Periscope. That's the one I couldn't remember because I never use it, but I'm there anyway. Uh, how are you? Episode 37. Golly, what a week it's been since I last uh, recorded a podcast. Um, there's a new incumbent at the White House, and I've blocked a couple of people on Instagram. Not for having views that differ from my own. No, no, no. But for uh, coming to my posts and insulting my friends for having views that differ from theirs. That's not acceptable. So consider yourselves blocked. Um, uh, it's been a short time since my last podcast and uh, by the way that's all I'm going to say on politics for today. My own feelings are very strong on the subject um, but uh, you know if anyone wants to chat to me uh, personally then feel free to send me a private message and we can rant at each other or on behalf of each other to our heart's content but I'm uh, not going to indulge in that here because if, if I start I won't be able to stop it's that simple. Um, <clears throat> I uh, haven't taken a great deal of time since my last podcast, and uh, there's a reason for that. This is not a New Year's resolution or anything like that, but uh, it, for lots of reasons, it's occurred to me that I want to um, I want to be a bit more regular. Well, ideally, I would like to podcast once a week at a regular day as well. Today is Sunday. It is the twenty. 2nd of January and uh, I'd like to make Sunday uploading a regular thing. Now whether that means the podcast will be available on a Sunday by the time it gets edited and uploaded I don't know or whether it'll trickle into Monday. I don't really want to trickle into Monday because I don't want to clash with uh, with people who I know have regular Monday uploads like uh, Katie Lovelli of Inside Number 23. Um, so maybe Sunday would be a better day for me to try and get it organised for. I'm just going to pause one second while I try to uh, sort out the exposure there. That's a bit better. So uh, that's the plan and I want to uh, have a regular schedule that people can sort of rely on. It's a bit dark now, isn't it? There we go, that'll do. Uh, have a regular schedule that people can rely on and I think, I think people like routine. I like routine. Uh, rather than just going, oh, it's been a while since I've recorded a podcast, I'll get out and do another one. It would be nice to know that I've got it scheduled in the diary, I make, a, I make time for it, and then, then you guys know where you are, and I know where I am, and it's nice to all know where we stand. Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> so, um, with that in mind, of course... I am aware that more regular podcasting does mean that I probably won't have quite as much knitting done in... Well, I won't. I mean, I just won't have had the time to do quite as much knitting, and so I may not have quite so much progress to show you on things as I have been inclined to uh, of late. But I think that's the payoff for having the routine and the regularity, so that's certainly my plan. Thank you, by the way, to everybody who has... Uh, commented and supported my choice to monetize the uh, the videos for the podcast. Um, I, I was really, really hoping it wouldn't put people off watching, um, and it doesn't seem to have done, so thank you. It's also uh, genuinely has made me change my podcasting uh, viewing habits. Um, I know that uh, Katie has monetized hers as well, and there's adverts on hers, which is great, and before I'd skip by them, but now I'm like, do you know what? I'm going to watch it. <laughs> I am. I'm going to sit there, I'm going to watch the whole thing. Sometimes they're only 30 seconds long, sometimes they're about a minute and a half, and that can be a bit of a schlep, but it's fine. It's a small price to pay, I think, for uh, saying thank you to someone's podcast that I really enjoy watching. So, Katie, thank you very much. Um, and what else did I want to say? Oh, uh, thank you too to all of the people out there in podcasty world who might also watch this one uh, that I've been watching recently. I have been really, really lucky in this last couple of days. I've had a couple of evenings where Ben's been out uh, running a quiz or doing various things where I've been able to just sit back, pick up my needles, 
get YouTube on the telly. That telly. Now I've got an Amazon Fire Stick. It's marvellous. Uh, no, no more am I watching people's podcasts on my laptop um, balanced on the arm of the chair. It's now on the telly, which I love. And uh, so who have I been watching recently? I've been catching up with, uh, with obviously with Katie. What an amazing time. It seems like she had in New York going to Vogue Knitting Live and doing all of the other amazing things, which I'm not going to spoil for anybody who hasn't yet seen it. But if you haven't yet, do pop over and catch up on Katie and Emrys's uh, New York Diaries. It just, uh, New York is one of my all time favorite cities. It really, really is. And I've, I've, all, I've, I've been going to New York for years and I love it. Um, and I'll be there in August this year and I can't wait. Really, really looking forward to it. So seeing uh, the diary post that Katie and Emrys put up of all of the things, I know all of those places so well. I didn't know where Vogue Knitting was held and as soon as I saw the outside I went, oh, it's the Marriott in Times Square. Um, it just, just lovely and, and I really, really enjoyed sharing that trip with Katie. So uh, thank you for posting that. If you haven't checked it out, then please do. Uh, I've also been thoroughly enjoying um, catching up with David at Dog Dare Podcast. Um, always, always lovely, always charming. Um, David, for those of you who don't know, is a multi-crafter and loves getting his hands dirty with anything related to any kind of craft, not necessarily fibre craft it seems. Um, but he's, he has this little, little chap that he's made called Mr. Fenn, uh, who is... Uh, both delightfully sinister and sinisterly delightful in equal measure and uh, it's made out of lots and lots of different crafts weaving and crochet I think and knitting and all, all sorts of stuff has gone into uh, sewing the, the, the making of Mr Fenn so that's been a joy uh, I have been catching up with Eric Lutz of Sticks Plus Twine who's another lovely lovely chap and lovely fellow friend of mine and virtual friend you know as we all are uh, not many of us uh, who who know each other through the the means of, of podcasting have actually met in in, in real life um, I'm hoping that's going to change in Edinburgh this year I'm hoping there will be lots of people that I'll be able to meet in the flesh which would be amazing um, and uh, I've also been getting myself up to date with uh, with John of Beardy Cheel podcast up in Thurso in Scotland um, who Every time I watch John's podcast, I'm just, I'm always delighted and charmed and thrilled by this man's love of knitting. I, I don't know why, there's something about watching John, maybe because it's, he's, maybe it's because he's a, a big, bluff, burly Scottish chap um, who is so passionate and so... Uh, wonderfully enthusiastic about knitting and about different fibres and uh, and there's no hint of yarn snobbery about him he can delight just as much in in cheaper things as in in more expensive things he finds something to love in in all things yarny and crafty and I don't know John you charm me every single time and I can't wait to meet you in Edinburgh um, who, else, who else have I been watching Oh, uh, and Fruity Knitting as well. Andrew and Andrea of the Fruity Knitting podcast. I've now, I'm, I'm not up to date at all. I'm a recent uh, convert to, to their podcast. I've only watched the first few. I, I know they're kind of up in the 30s now or something like that, but uh, um, I'm still in the, in the single figures. Um, but I'm, I'm really, really loving getting to know them. Um, Andrea's, if you haven't watched Fruity Knitting, Andrea is a very experienced colour work knitter, fair isle knitter. She knits a lot of Alice Starmore's patterns and uh, is really, really very, very proficient at it. I should be so lucky with my own journeys into stranded work at the moment. And uh, <laughs> golly, I, 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 just, I, I just watch. I love the banter between the two of them. I love their, their relationship dynamic. They're a married couple with a daughter and a dog and an uh, Australian couple living in Germany. Now, I don't think they're watchers of this podcast, um, but if Andrea, Andrea and Andrew, if you are watching, uh, thank you so much for sharing and putting all the stuff that you put into the Fruit Eating podcast. Yeah, I really love it. And of course, as always, Bakery Bears.
my dear friends Dan and Kay um, and uh, Ben and I watch a little bit of Dan and Kay as we fall asleep every night. We do it in sort of like 10 minute chunks. So it does take us a little while to, to get through uh, some of the longer podcast episodes, which we absolutely love. Um, and it's, you know, I've, I'm one episode behind. Um, and so I'm looking forward to getting the time to sit down and, and binge watch the last episode, bring myself up to date before you bring out a new one. Podcasting is a lot of fun. And I know it brings a lot of joy to a lot of people, um, none more so than me. So I enjoy doing this, but I also very much enjoy the watching of it. I am a, I like to be a reciprocal podcaster wherever I can. Um, what else? Oh, so in the roundup, what have I been doing since the last time I, I sent a podcast? Well, uh, I've been back to work at the, at the Shaftesbury Theatre. It's been not. God, it's hard to know what I can say and what I can't say. I haven't felt too settled there recently. I think maybe it's because I haven't been there very much. Um, and I think maybe it's there are some tricky aspects to dealing with certain groups of uh, customers, is what I'm going to say. Um, and it, it, it sort of takes the joy out of it a little bit. Um, but that kind of goes hand... That's OK, really. It's OK because it goes hand in glove with what I'm planning for this year. Uh, I would, I very much want to, I think I've said this in the last episode, I want to up the knitting work that I'm doing and and bring down the the day jobs type of work that I'm doing and, and really make a go of things knitting wise. So, uh, so it'll be okay if I end up doing a little bit less work at the Shaftesbury Theatre, um, for lots of reasons. It will mean that I'm in a position to be able to, it will mean that I don't lose the, sort of the love of what I do quite so soon if I do less of it spread out over a longer period of time, does that make sense? Uh. <clears throat> Um, and uh, also, since oh, uh, last weekend was uh, my good friend Tina's birthday. Now, Tina had a, uh, a very special zero birthday, and, uh, and she decided that she wanted to host her birthday with some knitting pals at the workshop and dye studio of John Dunballan of easyknits.co.uk. So uh, he and Roy, and Sweep, their lovely, lovely dachshund dog. He and Roy, his partner, um, put on a wonderful spread uh, of food, and Roy makes a really, really mean chilli. It's delicious. Not made with minced meat, it's made of little chunks of steak. It's gorgeous, it's really, really delicious. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just a lovely, lovely occasion, really nice to to see Tina's birthday through in style. Tina, for those of you who may not know, is like the co-moderator of the Sockmetician group on Ravelry. She's the one who set it up and encouraged me to uh, to, to have one. I wasn't really sure what all, all of that meant back then. Um, and so the fact that the group has grown to quite so many members and is quite so active all the time is, is, is all down to Tina. So thank you, Tina, very, very much. And uh, it was it was really really lovely. I met some of her uh, knitting friends that she's known through through Ravelry and Twitter for quite some time that I hadn't met before. And it's really really just lovely just to sit and chat and, and be surrounded by John's extraordinary and exquisite colours. Um, I think you all know John's work. Uh, if you don't, head over to easyknits.co.uk uh, and check out the. the particularly the Deeply Wicked range, there's such, such saturated, wonderful, wonderful colours. Um, uh, if you can hear coughing in the background, my husband is very, very poorly. Uh, he's, he was sitting on the, we have another sofa just here, and he was sitting on that, and I, I didn't banish him, I did say he was welcome to stay, but he said he might be a little bit too uh, vocal from the coughing, he's got a bad cold. I'm a little bit concerned that I might be about to come down with it myself, I've got a bit of a scratchy coffee throat going on myself as of last evening and today and I just dreading the thought of being ill like I was before Christmas because that lasted 10 11 weeks and I was really really rough so wish me luck on not getting poorly this time that would be amazing <sighs> I, don't, I, don't, I, I just 
I know that there's a weakness in my chest ever since I got pneumonia uh, a couple of years ago and, and these things do affect me a bit more harshly than they used to. Um, so whenever I, where there is a threat of getting ill, I just worry that I'm in for a really bumpy ride. Anyway, um, so that was lovely, going to John's and, and wishing Tina a happy birthday there. And uh, what else? Oh, uh, on Friday, Friday was, uh, was a tricky day for me. Uh, I was doing a singing waiter gig um, at a place in London, um, just on the river, one of the docks there, for one of the world's largest shipping companies, it turned out. I never get this information until I arrive. Um, I just get told where to turn up. I turn up and I do some singing and I go home. Um, so I... W <laughs> I turned up and uh, it turns out that the event was a leaving do for one of their CEO type members of staff who was not only a baron and a hereditary peer but also up until November last year was the Lord Mayor of London. Odd, I thought. How odd indeed to be uh, singing for the previous Lord Mayor of London to send him on his way. Um, oh, it's a tricky gig, I tell you, a tricky gig. Normally we do these things, there is a sit down dinner, and the way it works is I stand up and make an announcement pretending to be the maitre d' or the head of banqueting or, or whoever is running the room food wise, um, and then we sort of go into the act and the chef comes out and we do some singing together and then we do some really lovely singing and then there's another waiter that joins us and, and sings and we all do some lovely opera stuff together. Um, now I'm not an opera singer, everyone, everyone who knows me knows I'm not an opera singer, but my, my singing voice sort of lends itself to the more classical side of musical theatre rather than the, the sort of rocky side, so I'm much more lame than rent, if that makes sense. And so therefore it's not that difficult to uh, open up my resonance and uh, lower the larynx and, and create a, a much more rounded, operatic sounding tone. An opera singer wouldn't buy it, I, I know that, um, but when you're singing in Italian and you're singing these arias, um, they lend themselves to that style of singing much more easily anyway, and that all helps, and that all helps me to fake it. <laughs> A charlatan. <laughs> I have made, <coughs> excuse me, I have made a 20 something year career out of being a charlatan. If you heard that click, that was my spine. I'm so sorry. It wasn't my fingers this time. That was my thumb. Um, sorry. And uh, so, yeah, we sing some opera and um, I sing La Donna, uh, La Donna Immobile. And this time we were singing a new song. It's not a new song, it's a new song to us. Um, because it was a leaving do, the client had requested, it was a surprise from the chap who was leaving, um, the Lord, the Baron. Um, uh, it was a surprise from him, but we'd, instead of doing the finale song that we normally do, we'd been asked to sing the Andrea Bocelli and Sarah Brightman song, Time to Say Goodbye. Time to say goodbye, you know the one. That's the only line of it that's in English, so that was the easy bit. I was told this two days before the gig, so I got the news on Wednesday. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, doing Time to Say Goodbye, I've attached the, uh, the track and the music and the lyrics that we're going to do, uh, the way it's been split between the three of you. Learn some Italian. <laughs> oh, I don't speak Italian. I mean, I have a, a very tiny tiny smattering of Italian, but um, <clears throat> I really, it is mostly alien syllables to me, um, so desperately trying to let these words sink in, I was going through it again and again and again. And it's also a very difficult song, la 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 la, jumps out of nowhere, uh, and it's really really high for this little baritone, um, and that was the bit that I was doing solo, first time round. So it kind of had to be good, really reinforcing and anchoring everything, using every muscle in my body to like ping my voice up there. It's quite a challenge, and vocally I do enjoy a challenge. It's an exhausting song. Uh, but the three of us 
I had worked out a harmony from listening, actually from listening to uh, an Il Devo version of the song, because Andrea Bocelli and Sarah Brightman sing the whole thing in unison. And I thought with three of us, that's going to be curiously unimpressive. So I, I knew that Il Devo had sung it. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Il Devo are, they're four, uh, quite, they're four operatic singers that sing kind of pop versions of opera tunes. Um, but they all sing them in, in these wonderful four-part harmonies. So I thought, well, I'll listen to theirs. I can pick out a harmony. Um, <coughs> Most of the harmonies are higher than the tune. So, so I ended up giving myself a really, really difficult job. It's, but it's a difficult song as it was, but then I was singing like a third above the tune for most of it. Really, really tough. When we got there, it wasn't a sit-down dinner at all because it was a leaving drink. So it was just in this like open bar area, like a bit of a, like, it had a wooden floor, almost like a dance floor, or those that, that in their offices, so it wasn't a dance floor. Um, um, screens at one end. I think it was just a, a socialising area at this, this company's headquarters. Um, but they were all standing, and they were standing there with their canapes coming round on trays and, uh, and, and drinks, and those tall tables that you can perch a drink on when you're standing. So no one was sitting, um, which is very difficult to sort of be the focus of attention if everyone is standing and you're also standing and you're just part of the crowd. Um, so we had also tried to uh, encourage them to let us go before the speeches. We've been doing this a long time, and the people who put the act together, and who sell the act to the clients, they know how it works best. But nobody wants to trust us, nobody wants to take our opinion. They all think they know best. It's like, we've done this many, many times over many, many years. I'm telling you, it's going to be better if we go first. For lots of reasons. It's not just selfish reasons here. If we go first, A, selfishly for us, uh, it's fresh, the room is fresh, and people will be um, keener to, to engage and listen to what we're doing rather than switch off at the end of a load of speeches. But also, it's a really high impact act, and we leave the room on a real high. It always works, it's always very successful. And if, if we've done that, and then their speeches, people are going to be really, really enthused and really engaged with, with what you then, as the speaker, has to say. So for lots of reasons, it would have worked better if we'd gone first. Mm -mm. They didn't want that. So, and the speeches, of course, went on for hours. And when people are not sitting, they tire. So people, by the end of the speeches, were kind of like, now we just want to get, get now have some drinks. Um, and then this crazy man with a fake Italian accent starts talking to them about stuff they don't, they're not interested in because they've just done said goodbye to their friend and boss. So uh, there's a little bit of chit chat going on which normally doesn't happen, not aided by the fact that the sound in the room wasn't great, the, the mics were cutting out a bit and weren't very loud and, uh, and in fact Kirby, who was the third person, the girl, she, when she started her song her microphone wasn't working at all because one of their in-house frequencies was interfering with ours. I mean, there was a lot of things to contend with, a lot of things going wrong. So her, when she, I grabbed her over and we, I, we both sing, I put my arm around her and we were both singing into my microphone at one point until she could get another microphone sorted out. It was kind of tough, but we then got time to say goodbye. And we brought the uh, the Baron up with us, and we sang to him. Because uh, the beginning is all in Italian, and he didn't recognise the verse, so he was turning to Kirby, saying, "What is this song?" And she said, "Well, turn around and listen to what Nathan's just about to sing." And I then sang, "Time to say goodbye," in English. Uh, then went on into the the rest of the Italian lyric, uh, but it made the point. And he got quite choked up, which was lovely. Um, and we looked out and. Although some people had broken away and had gone off to do their own thing, there was a whole bank of people in front of us and they all had their phones up, filming everything. Now it's really interesting how things have changed. Obviously, I think life is to be experienced for real, not through a four inch screen that you're, so you're not really engaging with what's going on up there because you're just looking whether you're framing it right to watch it later. But you might as well watch it on someone else's video because you haven't seen it live because you've been watching it through your screen when you were there live anyway. Ugh. However, I used to get quite cross when people had their phones up, and I used to think, oh, that's, that's quite a, an imposition, it's a liberty, you know, to, to capture the images of something that we've been doing for them live as a one-off. It's not supposed to live on forever, it's supposed to be a one-off event, an ephemeral moment that, uh, 
that will never be repeated. And it's, uh, that's the contract you have between performance and live audience. It's, it's just special, it's just for you. And then it's on YouTube. That's different. So I used to get a bit cross. But actually now, I know that the mentality of the world has changed so much that it's a real compliment. If people are getting their phones up and starting to film what's going on, it's because they're really enjoying it. Um, and and so when I saw like 30 phones pointed at us while we were singing this song, I knew we were doing something right. Uh, and the harmonies went really, really well. And uh, we'd never sung the song together before. And because of various things, we didn't have a sound check. So we'd never sung the song out loud together. We'd, we'd literally, we got the track on our phone in, in the little room back, not backstage, but out the back somewhere where we were hiding from everybody until we started singing. And we were like, say goodbye, making sure no one could hear us. So that was all we'd ever done. So we hadn't, we'd never given it welly. Um, and it, it was really successful. And it is a big, powerful song. And it's got those, I don't know if you know the end of the song, but it doesn't finish the normal way you'd expect it to. It has these sort of crazy, unusual, scrunchy chords. And the harmonies we'd worked out were really, really exciting and, um, and very close harmonies. At one point, Peter and I were singing notes that were just a semitone apart. I was on an E and, uh, he was on an E and I was on an F natural. Um, and that would normally sound really like, oh, someone's doing it wrong, but it just sounded really dense. And I got excited, can you tell? <laughs> so that was, that was marvellous. And then yesterday I was at work. And yesterday evening, uh, we went round to our friend Daniel and Matthew's house. Now, I didn't see the twins because I finished work. Daniel and, and Matthew have two twins that are uh, son, son, their son and daughter. Um, and I love, I love the story of Dan, Daniel and Matthew's twins, Poppy and Finn. They, they, uh, they were born through surrogate pregnancy and, 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 a, and a separate uh, egg donor, a lady who donated her eggs for these two embryos. But the embryos were, um, were, se were fertilised separately. So one, although they, they both share the same genetic material from their biological mother, one uh, was fertilised with sperm from one of the dads and one with sperm from the other. So they were carried as twins in the surrogate mother um, and they have the same biological mother but they have two different fathers. And I think that's an amazing, amazing thing that science can create a family that is, they're twins but only actually half siblings. It's bizarre. Um, and, and fantastic, and binds the family, the four of them together, really, really well. Uh, so Ben got there before I did, because he wasn't at work, uh, so he got a chance to see them, but they were in bed by the time I got there. We had a lovely, lovely dinner. Um, we haven't seen them for probably about a year, um, even though they only live about a mile away. That's London living for you. I'm sure people, that's city living wherever. If you're in New York, I'm sure you don't always see people in your own city, in your own neighborhood. Um, and that brings us to today. So that's our roundup done. I've also done a bit of community there, haven't I? Um, so let's crack on. Um, thank you to everybody who's been continuing to leave questions in the podcast questions thread on Ravelry. Please, if you haven't done so already, head over, join the group, join the chat. Uh, like and subscribe this video down below. It's really, really good for me to get likes um, uh, and it costs you nothing at all. I keep having all these favours to ask you. I'll tell you, I'm doing my best to grow the brand. Help me, help me if you can. So I'm going to uh, go through my podcast questions thread. There's quite a few. I'm not going to answer all of them uh, on the podcast. Some of them I will actually answer privately. Uh, I think that's probably best to go around it here. Now, um, here we go. So Aileen, who's a little bush baby uh, up in Scotland, um, She's asking me what do what would I what touristy things would I recommend in London? I think I'm probably going to give this more thought and get back to you uh, personally, Aileen, um, because I want to to really make sure I give give this justice, not just sort of think of stream of consciousness off the top of my head. Um, but if you, I know you haven't been to London for about ten years, but 
have you been to the London Aquarium? Have you been on the London Eye? Nitty-wisey things. Uh, yes, you're going to go and try and go to Loop, but you should also possibly uh, go to Wild and Woolly, which is one of my other all-time favourite shops in London. Uh, Wild and Woolly is a little bit further out of the centre, so you might need to plan how to get there. It's in Lower Clapton. Um, but it's run by my very good friend Anna, and it's tiny, it's really tiny, but she's got such a, a welcoming uh, persona and you'll be, you'll be made very, very welcome in there. And you will also see a really, really lovely range of very, very, very nice yarns. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll chat to you more about that. Um, Jardine who is, uh, who I don't know where you're from, Jardine, and there's no profile picture of me. Uh, oh, there's no information at all on your Ravelry podcast, so, uh, uh, profile, so that's absolutely fine. I don't have anything to share, but you are Jardine. Um, hi, Nathan, I've been doing the binge watching on the podcast, and I have a question. Do you use a reinforcement thread with any of the yarns that do not have nylon in them for socks? I have been, and sometimes I have found yarns that have the threads included with the ball of yarn. Yes, I'm aware of those too. Um, but mostly use woolly nylon held with my yarn for toes and heels. Well, I don't actually. Um, I, I've got a lot of sock yarn that calls itself sock yarn, but doesn't have any nylon content in it at all. Namely, Malabrigo sock. Uh, which I love, I absolutely love as a yarn, and I have knitted many pairs of socks with it. Um, but they don't wear very well as socks. It's beautiful for shawls, and it's quite a fine fingering weight as well. Uh, so it, it's, it lends itself well to lacy things, but it ain't so great for socks, even though it's called Alavigo sock. Um, However, I still like making socks out of it. It feels lovely running through your fingers. Um, I could reinforce with nylon. I don't. I just tend to choose the days I wear certain socks, depending on what I'm going to be doing. If I've got a day in the house where I'm not planning really to go out, then I can wear one of those pairs of socks that, that won't wear very well because they're not going to get very much hard wear. But if I'm going to be out in shoes all day where there's going to be things rubbing against the heel um, and hard hard surfaces that I'm walking long distances on, then <clears throat> I tend to wear one of the pairs of socks that are made with with more specific sock yarn. I know Malibu sock is a specific, calls itself a sock yarn. It's not. Um, so, so that's how I tend to go around it. Uh, get around it, I should say, and go about things. And then uh, Sweetheart77, who is Kathleen from St. Louis in Missouri, might actually be doing St. Louis on our epic journey across the States in August. Just saying. I don't know if we're staying there the night or whether we're just driving through. And I don't know if we'll have enough time in our schedule because we've got a lot of hours in the car on a lot of different days where we have to get to certain places. Um, but I have a feeling around the 20th of August, something like that, we might be in St. Louis. I'll keep you posted. Um, Hi Nathan, how did you and Ben meet and fall in love? What's your story? With Valentine's Day fast approaching, don't start. I'd love a sweet romantic tale. Now, I'm not sure if it really is a sweet romantic tale. Um, Ben and I met working on a show together in the West End. It was the show called Taboo, which was uh, the Boy George musical. It did make it to Broadway and they changed it enormously for Broadway and tried to make it into a Broadway show. It's never a Broadway show. It's this lovely sort of dark underground, dingy, vibey 1980s subculture musical that never wanted to be a glossy, glitzy Broadway show. And it didn't do very well on Broadway, so for all you US people who know it from that, you think, oh, well, that was a bit rubbish. It was so much better in London. Um, and I was not in the original cast, but I went in after the show had been running for about nine months, I think. Um, and Ben was working on the show, had been right from before the beginning, um, and was the uh, resident director on the show. So he was in charge of putting new cast members into the show. 
uh, and making smooth transitions so that the show maintains its integrity. And there were three of us who joined the show at that time, it was a mini cast change, me, uh, uh, an actor called Ryan Malloy, and uh, Julian Clary. Now I don't know if Julian Clary is well known in America, but he certainly is in this country. Ben and I went to see uh, Pantomime at the Palladium a couple of weeks ago and Julian was in it and he was filthy. Absolutely filthy. <laughs> now I know Julian and we shared a dressing room together for a good few months. Um, and he's adorable and quite shy, but his onstage persona is less shy. And uh, this was a children's show and the the calibre of the jokes was brilliant. He's very, very witty and very clever and knows how to work a crowd. I think what was shocking was the fact that he was saying such utterly awful things in a children's show. They wouldn't necessarily have been quite that outrageous if it had been an adult evening. But of course, with little children, entendre goes, you know, double entendre goes straight across people's heads. One can hope. It's very, very funny. Anyway, um, so on day one of my rehearsals, I hadn't actually met Ben at any of the auditions. He'd been ill while I had been auditioned and had been offered the job. So I turned up for day one of rehearsals um, and I was sitting in the bar talking to the musical director, who I did know from my auditions, and we were just chatting. I was a bit nervous, you know, because first day of rehearsal, didn't know what to expect. And, uh, and somebody walked in, um, and I, I did an absolute double take. And I, I just thought, good lord, he's, he's a handsome man. I wonder if he'll be working with me. Um, I th you know, people don't necessarily have a type, but you sort of do. I mean, I, people, the people I find attractive don't always fit into the type that I would say that I have, but I looked at Ben and I was like, oh, he's exactly my type. Um, and we, it turns out that he had a similar reaction when he saw me, and it was, it was we got together quite quickly. We sort of spent a lot of time together anyway in the show, but I want to just point out that there's nothing unprofessional about the way we got together. We, um, we were very, very aware that he was sort of my boss, and, and that that could cause friction with other people in the company, certainly with producers and things like that. So we didn't keep anything secret, but we just made sure that whenever we were on the job, in the theatre, doing the things we needed to do, we were incredibly professional about it. So even though we'd started dating, when Ben was rehearsing me into some of my understudy roles, and there were times when it was just him and me in the building, um, we still would spend three hours working on the script and, and going in depth into the character rather than sort of holding hands and gazing longingly at each other. There was none of that went on. We, we kept our, our professional lives and our personal lives very separate even though they were obviously intertwined. So I don't know that that's a particularly romantic story. Um, the show only lasted about eight months and nearly 15 years later we're still going strong. So uh, something's going right. Odd to think at that time when, when that that person who was Ben walked into the bar that twelve years later we'd end up getting married, and uh, not only that, but we we'd be doing it in a film musical for television. <laughs> it's funny how things turn out, isn't it? <laughs> Excuse me. Just goes to show you. Don't it go to show you never can tell. I'm drinking with a straw. Normally, I, as you know, I slightly make fun of uh, tea drinking on podcasts. I, it's not something I share. This is water. Um, but I did want to share my drinking straw. Listen. It's metal. It's stainless steel. But it's even got the little ridges on it to make it look like a proper drinking straw, which it is. This was a gift from my sister. When you have a moustache like this, having your own straw to carry with you for drinking is very, very useful. 
one of the simplest, silliest, and yet most appreciated gifts my sister has ever given me. <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. <coughs> so Kathleen, that's the story of how Ben and I met. Uh, I think he's still ruining the day. <laughs> uh, my question says Shamu. Now where are you, Shamu? Let's uh, let's just find out. Oh my. Here it comes Karen. You are. Oh, from Harrow. You're just up the road. Hello. <laughs> my question relates to my post on the thread of introductions. I may not have caught up with that yet. I don't think I've seen yours. Um, I'm a barbershop singer. Brilliant. Love it. And would love to form a competing quartet. <laughs> What singing related goals have you got at the moment? Do you sing for pleasure rather than just when employed? What's your music of choice? Golly, um, right, let me break that down. What singing related goals have you got at the moment? Well, actually, very simple, I, I can easily answer that. My, my singing goals right now are to get my voice back into tip-top condition. Um, the last couple of years I've, I've had some vocal health problems which I think are pretty much, I'm through them, pretty much over, um, but what I haven't been doing for a while is singing. Um, towards the middle of last year and into the end of last year I really felt I was getting somewhere with, with the, the vocal tension issues that I was having and uh, I don't feel that that's causing me quite so many problems at all now, but then I just at this kind of time when I felt I really wanted to start working on building up my stamina and, and getting the finesse and the, and the tone quality back into my voice that I'm used to having from before, I got that stupid chest infection. <clears throat> and I, was, I did a couple of gigs while I was ill and then I had to cancel one because I just, I thought I'm, I'm just not going to get through it. Um, and it's not, it wasn't, I wasn't worried about doing damage, I was more worried about literally the sounding awful, sound like some crazy foghorn that just couldn't hit the notes. And I didn't want to do that for my own pride or for obviously the, the reputation of the company I sing for. So I, I cancelled and I actually haven't sung at all from that point, which was back in December, until the gig the other day. So my, I was a little bit concerned about um, the condition my voice would be in, particularly with a new song. It's alright when it's singing songs that you know and the muscles know what to do, but when it's new material, uh, it can be a little bit more tricky. So I I was a little bit trepidatious, shall we say, about uh, about that gig, but it went all right. Um, it was really tiring and my voice doesn't have the stamina it needs. So at the moment I want to go back to boot camp. I want to start singing every day and I want to start doing proper warm-ups and I want to uh, really build up the strength that I know I should have so that whenever I do get a gig out of the blue, I can just go, yep, yeah, match fit. So that's the that's the goal at the moment. Um, do you sing for pleasure rather than when employed? Well, that's interesting, actually. I mean, I, I, I enjoy singing so much, so even when I'm singing when I'm employed, I, I am singing for pleasure. I love doing it. Um, I love it less when my voice isn't necessarily up to scratch. So I tend, when the last few years, when I've been going through those problems, um, I have been singing less, but mostly because I haven't been wanting to exacerbate the problems or tire my voice out, which of course is a double-edged sword because then you lose the stamina if you're not singing all the time, so I should actually keep singing. But when the voice isn't doing what you want it to, it's hard to enjoy the sounds it's making because you're constantly thinking, it reminds you that there's an issue. So at the moment I haven't been. Um, I'm having a hum, I'm always do 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 humming along and, and, and things like that, but, but I don't really sort of sing out in the house. Um, I've got quite a big voice and humming along with something is different from properly giving it large. So I have to really, really want to sing to be in that position. But singing's always a pleasure. It's, it's, it's an outward expression of inner joy is how I've always looked at singing and I've always called it that and, and I genuinely, genuinely believe that. People don't sing spontaneously. People don't spontaneously sing when they're upset or angry or frightened. You only sing when you're happy. It, it's this outpouring, this, this sort of outward expression of what's inside you. And it's always beautiful. 
Someone's joy is always beautiful. Never tell someone they can't sing. Never tell them that the singing is not very pleasant. It's always a representation of their joy, and their joy is always beautiful. And what's your music of choice? Um, well, to sing, it's musical theatre, uh, always, always. I love singing musical theatre. I love songs that have character and have uh, emotions and a narrative journey within them. Uh, and you don't get that in a pop song. I don't really listen to a lot of musical theatre soundtracks anymore. I used to all the time. I was obsessed. Um, now I, quite, I, I like it. I like kind of soft to medium rock music. Love Elliot Minor. Absolutely love Elliot Minor. I listen to a lot of Elliot Minor at the moment. Obviously ABBA, always going to be the, the top. Love, I love, I like all, all sorts of things really. I don't, I'm not a huge rap or R&B fan, but pretty much anything else. Um, but to sing, it's got to be musical theatre. Now we have, uh, a, question, a set of questions here from uh, Ms Lacey, who is Christine, who is I believe in Texas, let me check on that. Oh yes, yeah, you are, Texas. Um, now Christine has done something brilliant, and I'm going to be talking about Christine in a minute, but I'm going back to the questions for this, so I'll, I'll shelve that for now. Park it, leave it. Um, and she has said... Um, I don't want to share too much of Christine's story. It's there on the thread if you want to. She's um, she shared some very personal things, which and thank you for that. I'm very grateful to to know your story, and I and I, I don't think it's my job to share it with everybody else. But because it's public enough, then people can feel free to go to the podcast thread, podcast questions thread, and and find out what I'm talking about. But I will say that uh, Christine suffers from Parkinson's, uh, and it's uh, it affects uh, cognitive um, processing. Uh, for her. So I know that there's things that she finds difficult within knitting um, and one of those things is is chart reading um, and she's had to really really sort of relearn how to to process the information from a chart which to me is, is kind of a revelation. For me a chart is just well that's a picture of your knitting. That's it. You just have to do what's there. Um, but obviously different people's brains work in different ways and particularly if something is misfiring. <coughs> So, all of this <clears throat> leads up to her podcast questions. Number one, what would you say your biggest challenge in life has been to date? <clears throat> and how has getting past it changed how you view others? <clears throat> Golly, that's, a, that's so deep, and I'm not sure I, I can delve deeply enough to, to answer it and do it justice. Um, I think the biggest challenge in life, the, the one that jumps out at me, is... Is, is is being a being a gay man in a straight world. I've got a proper frog in my throat there, so just that that cut is just editing out some rather horrible and unpleasant noises. Um, so I think growing up in a world where it was illegal to talk, for teachers to promote homosexuality in a positive light in schools, therefore meaning that they couldn't talk to pupils who were struggling, and Nowadays, there's less reason to struggle because a lot of places are much more open understanding, but not all. Um, I've certainly had good experiences, but I know that's not true for my uh, LGBT brothers and sisters around the world, and often around this country too. Um, it's, I think, I think coming to terms with being a gay man is is not really what I mean. It's coming to terms with being something that is other than what a lot of people think is an acceptable way to be. So you're so realising that you are being viewed as unacceptable. I think it's really, really tough. Really, really tough and cruel and harsh. And I think moving through that and fully accepting that not everybody is going to like all the facets of who I am but that I don't care about that. That has been, that was a challenge, but the biggest challenges often bring the biggest, the biggest rewards, and the reward is I don't care anymore. Um, I am very much, as everybody who knows, who watches this podcast, take me as you find me or trot on. 
And that goes for my political views, that goes for my personal dealings with people around me, uh, it goes with growing a beard, it grows with being a gay man. Um, all of those things. It, it goes with being a knitter out in public as a boy. Uh, all of those things. Take me as, you, as I am or move on because if you can't do that, I'm not interested in having you in my life either on a casual basis or on a, on a more formal basis. Just not interested in people who can't accept someone for who they are. <clears throat> so I think that's been uh, interesting. How has it changed how I view other people? Well, it's made me, oddly, less tolerant. Certainly less tolerant of bigotry, less tolerant of prejudice, less tolerant of uh, the kind of behaviour that that would think it's acceptable to treat somebody badly because they are different from you. That's what it's made me. It's, it's, it's empowered me and hopefully empowers me to empower other people um, to say, we're amazing. People are amazing. And uh, the wonderful thing about being amazing is you only need to surround yourself with amazing people. Well, I said it was a bit deep. And for that, you'll get no apologies. Because if you didn't like it, I don't care. Um, back to knitting. Uh, Christine also says, of all the techniques you have yet to try in knitting, what are you looking forward to the most or the least? <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's anything left. There must, there, I, I genuinely don't know. I've given lots of things a go and thoroughly enjoyed them or not, my Latvian mittens. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm getting on well with colour work. Obviously, I love double knitting. I love brioche. Um, I've not done enough brioche yet. I want to do more. And I've got plans this year to delve into brioche in, in a slightly different way. Um, I don't want to talk about that now, but it's, it's got a long-term thing that I want to be working on. Um, textured knitting. More garments really. I'm looking forward to, to more garments. Uh, that's coming. Uh, I know that. I've got to the stage where I want to have things I can actually wear continually rather than just stuff you put on when you go outside. <laughs> <coughs> so I, I, I want to have jumpers and things rather than just accessories. Obviously socks you wear all day but they're not. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. So uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. What I'm least looking forward to, well, nothing really. I'm not really looking forward to getting back to those Latvian mittens. I probably will. I don't, I don't want to just leave them there. Um, <clears throat> the only other thing I've ever started and not finished is a Sanko glove, and that really annoys me because I love the Sanko designs. I just wasn't enjoying knitting the gloves. Now I'm better at stranded work, perhaps. Perhaps I can go back to it. I suspect my gauge would have changed immeasurably though since then. So I might have to abandon what I did before. I actually forgot I was podcasting then and just started thinking aloud. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you have dabbled in processing wool and spinning. Yes, I have, but only dabbled. Have you given any thought to weaving at all? Well, I have actually. Um, I think... I'd like to give weaving a go. I don't think it would be a good idea for me to go out and buy a load of kit um, in case it's not something I'm particularly interested in. <clears throat> like the spinning I've done, I'll probably do a little bit more spinning, but uh, it, it's not a passion of mine. It hasn't become one and I don't think it will. Um, <clears throat> I suspect uh, weaving would be something like that, although I really do enjoy watching David from the Dog Dare uh, podcast. I love watching him doing his weaving and I think I think you want to feature your you're weaving a bit more I love it um, there we are that's your questions Christine um, I hope that's been okay for you then we have twiddling sister um, who has a simple question it's Jocelyn from Indiana uh, she says I've recently fallen down the brioche rabbit hole and I am officially obsessed well you and the rest of the, the western knitting world it seems I remember loving the cabled brioche hat that you did and I'm wondering if you're planning to release it I'd really love to knit this well I can't remember how I did it and I didn't take any notes 
I know it's basically just cable, but the crown decreases. I've got no idea what I did. So I would have to uh, kind of revent it um, and work it all out again. It, it always was a plan to release it. It's kind of fallen by the wayside. I ain't going to promise anything. Um, but it's done with the one pass brioche rather than two pass, um, which I enjoyed doing and maybe I'll go back to it, but don't hold me to that. <clears throat> and then uh, I have a question for you, says Jelly Baby Bex. Jelly Baby Bex, I'm going to assume is called Rebecca. Are you? Yeah, Becky. Becky. Uh, from York. Ben went to university in York. Hello, Becky. Uh, a question for you. Would you, have you ever done pantomime as a musical theatre type with a love of the ridiculous? I love it. <clears throat> and every time I go, I regret not pursuing it as a career. So I'm very envious of your lifestyle. Well, it's hard, you know. It's a lot of fun, and don't get me wrong, but you might have a regular paycheck coming in for all I know. <laughs> all that I've got. Um, <coughs> yes, I've done two pantos professionally. And my first job was uh, a two-production rep job at the Theatre Royal in Northampton. The Royal Theatre in Northampton, sorry. And, uh, and the second of those two jobs was pantomime. I did Aladdin. I played Wan Sung Hai, one of the Chinese policemen. My partner in crime was called Wan Sung Lo. And uh, two, th three years ago, two, three years ago, I did uh, panto up in Wakefield, um, not a million miles away from you and where I played Ghastly Gordon, the baddie, in Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, panto's really, really hard work. Panto done well is brilliant. Panto is often not done well. Um, that's not the reason I've only... I did one sort of like 18 years apart, these two pantomimes I did. Um, I love the craft of Panto. I really thoroughly enjoy working in that sphere, but I, I need it to be good. I don't want it just to be a commercial way of getting loads of X Factor stars on the stage and no thought gone into it. I like a really well-crafted piece. So if I could find one of those again, I'd happily, happily do more. And I think, uh, I think that's it. <clears throat> Head over to the podcast questions thread. Please add your questions. What I, what I, I have a plea. There are a few people, um, it is, Seeming like uh, people just go in there and ask sort of knitting advice questions. It's not that. It's um, ask questions to me, of me. Um, there are other places to put knitting advice uh, related questions and somebody, I or someone else, will, will do our best to answer them for you. But that's not what this thread's about. That's about this and about sharing and engaging and getting to know each other a little bit more well weller and betterish. Wellerer and betterish. Mm. <laughs> so let's move on, shall we? Um, okay. While I was at uh, John Dunbanham's studio, he and I had been messaging each other. I contacted him. We've known each other for ages, and we're good friends. But I've, we've been messaging him about something that I sort of want to share a little bit of information about with you now. And we got together and we had a little business chat. We are going to be embarking on, we are planning to embark on a very, very exciting collaboration. Between the two of us, with my, I have an idea and John has the expertise to uh, perfect this. And so between the two of us, we're going to collaborate on designing and creating a very special Sockmetician colourway. I can't bear it, I can't bear how excited I am by this. So special, in fact, and it's going to be exclusively available through John. For you guys. <laughs> how exciting is that? I don't want to give away too much of it now. I know what it would involve. Um, but until we get a little bit further down the line and maybe have something to show, I'm going to keep more detail about that a little bit close to my chest. But we're, we're in talks as to whether or not it will be sold as a kit with a, an exclusively designed pattern. 
for the yarn in question that I will design and have that, or whether it will just be something that will be just the yarn on its own, and it will be the colourway which is all important. But it will be something that directly relates to me, and it will be something that I hope all of you will go, I need that yarn. <laughs> I know that I'm going to need it when it happens. I'm so excited. I can't bear it. It's going to be amazing. So watch this space for more information about uh, John. Now, uh, oh, in the other news, roundup-wise, I forgot to say, um, I have been busy working on the pattern for the allele socks. Which are these? <coughs> Excuse me again, a bit froggy today. These. Uh, and Ben and I, the other day, went out uh, into the woods and took photographs of the hat, the allele hat. Oh, it is so lovely. Isn't it beautiful? Look at that crown. Gorgeous. And the allele socks. So, uh, with that in mind, I got to the stage where I'm more or less done. Now, uh, hello to Isabel. I don't know if you watch Isabel, actually, but Isabel is a wonderful, wonderful uh, French knitter. And she offered to test knit uh, something for me, and I thought, well, she's a brilliant sock knitter. So this was the pattern I sent to her to do, and, and she's helped me enormously. So I've been putting together, because I I knitted the medium size sock, the 72 stitch sock, but I'm writing it up for 64, 72 and 80, uh, so it'll be as versatile as possible. And uh, I, I needed help with one of the other sides, I was just, I'd done what I thought the math should be, but I needed someone to make sure it all works. I dashed it off, I made a lot of mistakes, she uh, has helped me enormously, and Ben and, and I went out and took some photographs, and I've done the writing up, and we're nearly ready to go, nearly ready to go. I just now need to send it off to, I want to get the hat done as well, uh, I think it's ready, I just need to put the layouts together, then I'm going to send it off to Michelle, who is expecting it any day now, and then as soon as it's tech edited, they'll both be available for release uh, very soon. Um, the idea is that you'll be able to buy them separately, or you'll be able to buy them as a, as a package. Um, but some of these photographs are so ridiculous. I really, really love, really, really love, I was out in the woods, it's the bright, the brightest socks on, and they, they kind of took over. The it was so difficult to get the lighting right. So you can see the the background looks really really dark. It was quite a sunny day actually, but um, <laughs> we took some ridiculous, um, we took some absolutely ridiculous photographs. Let me show you this one. Get this one bigger on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and where's the other ones? <coughs> Who said knitting patterns can't have a sense of humour, eh? Eh? So they, those patterns are on their way, which will be great. Um, I... I always... I always do uh, offer Pat, new patterns for sale at a bit of a discount at my, with, on my newsletter. So if you want to be in the first wave, usually only over for about a week, uh, so if you want to know about the exclusive newsletter discount, then you have to sign up for the newsletter. And you can do that at sockmetician.com forward slash newsletter. It's very, very simple. And rest assured, I will never pass on the details to anybody else. Uh, my newsletter is run through MailChimp, and their code of practice and code of conduct are very strict, uh, and I adhere to them always at all times. So if you do want to sign up to the newsletter then please do and you can be in with a chance, well you won't, you won't be in with a chance, you will get a special code for a uh, discount on the socks or the hat. There will always be, there will already be a discount for both together so I probably won't add a second discount because I know Ravelry doesn't do it that way. Um, so that's that. Now I just want to um, dive in, what else, what else did I want to say? There's something else I wanted to talk about. Can't remember. Anyway, well, let's move on. <clears throat> let's move on. Oh, uh, oh, this is it. 
the Christmas cast on Cal that's not a Cal continues. The thread is brilliant, everyone's in it. Um, I'm probably going to close it at the end of the month. So we've got another week to go. Um, I might let it dribble into February a little bit, but <clears throat> I think what's more important is that we get it uh, sorted. So I uh, just want to quickly show again the wonderful prize that's come from Crit Young Handmade, which is this uh, lovely blue tartan, uh, really soft fabric and clear plastic uh, project bag with a great hand strap and the uh, stitch markers and the little kit that comes with them there, as well as the matching yarn. That beautiful, beautiful, look how well matched that is. Look at that. It's going to be amazing. Actually, this looks more purple on the phone than it actually is. In real life, they match very, very well. That's probably about right. Really, really lovely. So, uh, so that's one of the main prizes. There will be another prize as well that I can't actually talk about. It's, it's a knitting pattern book. I don't have it in my possession yet, but I will do soon. So uh, when I, there was, um, I'll give away some patterns as well. Um, so I'll be doing the, hear that? My voice is getting a little bit. I think I am getting ill. <clears throat> no doubt about it. My husband has been very, very generous and shared his germs. Thanks, thanks very much, Ben. Thank you so, so much. Get on the vitamin today. So uh, you've seen these. Lovely, that's coming your way very, very soon. Let's move on into Stash Enhancement, shall we? Stash Enhancement, <clears throat> I wasn't going to have any at all to show you. Um, I was looking at my stash. I don't need to buy any more yarn. I've got enough yarn to be going on with for a very, very long time. So, I'm not going to just buy yarn this year on spec. That said, there will be some exceptions and caveats to that. I'm going to quite a lot of yarn fairs and festivals this year because I'm doing quite a lot of teaching. I will be putting up somewhere on Ravelry a post with my... Um, I'll, I'll open up a thread with my teaching commitments and where you can find me around the UK and hopefully beyond uh, this year. And I'll do it like a little diary, uh, which I'll keep updated so people can always know where to find me. Um, so at the yarn fairs, it's hard not to buy stuff. But I'm not just going to go out and buy things. I've got plenty of loot for socks. I've got enough sock yarn. Um, I've got double knitting stuff planned, stacking up, that I know I've got the stuff for in stash. So I'm not planning to buy any things. Um, gifts, however. And I was given a gift. Tina, at her birthday last week, gave me this. This is Alpaca Delight. In this wonderful, I'm assuming that this is a natural colour. It's a four ply fingering weight and it is a uh, natural fawn, it's called. I, it says batch number, so it's not. So I, I think this is a natural colour. Smells wonderful. Um, and it's 70% alpaca and 30% Falklands Merino. Uh, it's really hairy, it'll bloom quite a lot, I think. A lot of guard hairs on that. But I, it's, it's just gorgeous. It's really, really lovely. Everyone who knows me knows I have a thing for alpaca. I love working with it, I love wearing it, uh, I love everything about it. And this comes from, uh, it is John R. Bond Textiles, um, and they're down in Devon. I love everything about, everything about John R. Bond yarns. I, this one I didn't know as a base. It's gorgeous, and I don't know what it'll be. It's, it was given to me as a present by Tina, even though it was her birthday, because uh, she had been given it at uh, a yarn crawl thing she'd gone on, and she can't work with alpaca. She has a, a, a reaction to it. So, she knows I like it. And I love the colour, I love the naturalness of it. I love the fact that that'll go with pretty much anything. I might combine it with something else. I do have some other four-ply fingering uh, alpaca in a <coughs> kind of an olive green colour, and I think that might work very, very well together. I haven't put the two together side by side yet, so I might be wrong. But it's very, very nice. So, Tina, thank you very much for that. Well, let's move on, shall we, into uh, whips. Actually, no. Let's do 
No, let's, yeah, let's do whips. Let's do whips. Currently, apart from the things that I'm not going to show you, I've still got the, the two scarves on the go, um, which I haven't made any progress on. I've been knitting furiously and monogamously uh, recently, and with only one project on the needles, so much. That's a sentence didn't go anywhere. Um, <laughs> losing the ability to speak coherently. Um, so I have the Il Barato scarf, which I haven't done since I last saw you, I haven't worked on at all since I last saw you, and the piano number two, three, sorry. Those are pending and, and resting just for a little bit because um, I've been working on two projects, one of which I finished and the other is this. This is the Nahani River. Um, am I part way through a round? I have, I've stopped part way through a round, I don't know why I've done that. Um, this is the Nahani River uh, tank top, sweater vest as you call them in the States, um, which I've been working on. I bought the kit in Edinburgh last year, for those of you who don't know, and my plan is to have it ready to wear at Edinburgh this year. So this is how it's coming together. Last time I showed you, I was kind of up to out there I think, and I've done this whole darker section since. So it starts off with uh, a corrugated rib, the dark navy you can't really see there is pearl, pearl uh, columns. Then you've got this light blue kind of snowflake pattern with the uh, sort of X's going on. And then offset with that, you've got a different type of snowflake. Uh, can you see how they're, they're not directly on top of each other? They're in the gaps of the ones in the layer below in the much darker colors. Uh, and then you've got these little borders of these little diamonds here and here. Now this, I've just got to the top of uh, the first repeat. So actually this lighter colour that's on the needles here actually correlates to what's going on down here. So I'm about to then repeat the pattern again. Um, and I'm really, really enjoying knitting it. So different from my experience with the Latvian mittens. I'm very, very happy with how it's coming on. I think my tension is looking, let me try and get this in the light, it's looking pretty even. There's no real, uh, oh, it's, it's odd at the sides. It does have a, a faux seam. If I open that up, you can see there's a line down there. That's a column of pearl stitches to, uh, that, to go both sides of the underarms, just so that it will center the pattern in the middle. Um, but it's very, very even. Um, I'm enjoying the fact that I'm not getting any puckering going on. My Even on these sections where there's only one stitch, they're quite... They're all right. They're all right. Let me show you. Oh, there you go, something like that. There's no stitches tucking behind any other stitches or anything like that. And here on the back, I've got all of that stuff going on. I really like it and it's it's quite a stretchy fabric. I've not I haven't pulled my floats tightly enough so that it's uh it's not gonna have any give to it. So I think in a block after a little I don't want to I don't want this to get any bigger, but I think I'll I'll wash it and, and give it a block just to even things out a bit. Um, but I'm really, really happy with it. I think it's gonna be gorgeous. Um I've lost my needles. Hang on. Probably lost a lot of stitches. Hang on. Oh yeah, look at that. Uh, it's all right. I'm knitting this with the uh, Jameson's spin drift. And the joy of that, it's so sticky and so grippy and grabby that uh, <laughs> when, uh, when it comes off the needles, which it does all the time, those stitches don't go anywhere. <laughs> and you can literally just go <laughs> straight back through all of them and <laughs> it's fine. So it's um, it's interesting, the, the two yarns, I'm not used to working something quite this grabby, the two yarns do sometimes stick to each other and wrap around each other a bit, but um, overall I'm really enjoying it. And I'm making sure I keep my motif yarn to the left and the uh, darker colour to the right and this is how, this is how I work with my two yarns over one finger. And that's what I do, so I can either take the dark one or the light one. I think I showed you this last time. Um, but I really, for me, it works very, very well and I get even tension across the two yarns that way, which is very, very nice. 
unlike when I put my other yarn in the other hand. I'm burbling again, but I, I'm sort of a bit in love with it. Now, this is really interesting. I in no way got gauge. Mm -mm. It says 32 stitches per 4 inches, and I got 30. So my stitch is a bit bigger, quite a lot bigger, in fact. Um, and over the 300 odd stitches in the round, it was going to add up to several inches worth of biggerness. Um, so I had been planning to make the size 42, I think I said this last time, um, but if I didn't go into detail, I was going to be making the size 42 inch chest because I'm about 40, and it's 39, 40, or 45, or 48. Um, and I wanted to make the 42, but it was going to be about 46, something like that, 45, 46 inches around the chest if I worked that many stitches at the gauge that I have. I didn't want to go down a needle size um, because I quite like the fabric I was making for a start, which is always a good thing. Um, it, it does have a bit of drape to it, it's not too rigid. I mean, it's certainly got body to it, but it's not too rigid the way a lot of Fair Isle can be. Um, but I also didn't want, I didn't really relish, these are, these are only 3.25s, and I didn't relish the idea of knitting on really tiny needles for the whole project. So I've got, I'm knitting the version which is supposed to be 39 inches, and it's probably actually going to be nearer 41, which is about perfect for me. So I, it's hard to tell, I can't properly stretch it out to measure it without putting it on scrap yarn, I just haven't been bothered to do that yet, because otherwise I'll lose a lot of stitches from the needles, and I... Even though I've said they don't go anywhere, I still don't want to worry about doing that. But I've had a bit of a measure, and it it looks to be like a slack 40. So I think it'll be about 41, which which is great. 42 might have been too big, even if I'd got gauge. This is probably going to work out better. What it does mean, of course, is I'm, I'm aware that I do need to pay very close attention to row gauge, because my row gauge is going to be bigger, so if I knit the amount of rows it suggests, then I'll probably end up with something that goes down to my knees, which I don't really want. Um, so I'm going to have to alter that around the the sleeve steek and the steek for the, the v-neck as well. Um, I'm also going to be modifying the pattern because I want the, this v-neck that in the pattern starts at the same time as the underarm, so the v-neck kind of comes down to here. It's a bit 70s really. Uh, so I actually, I'm going to start the arms the armholes where I where I should, and I'm going to leave the neck for probably half of one of these layers, probably about another two inches, something like that, before I start the V-neck. So of course that's going to alter, I'd have to do some careful maths altering with my row gauge, how many rows it's likely to take me from that point, that point to this point, work out what decreases I need to do to make the neck wide enough and even enough. I'm not scared by that. Um, I feel I should be, but I'm not. I'm actually quite looking forward to it. Anyway, so that's the Nahani River, and I'm really, really enjoying it. So I did think I didn't like st stranded work. I think it's a beautiful pattern. It's funny, it, it comes as a kit, but it looks like every single project on Ravelry has been made in exactly the same colours. So I don't think, I don't think I've seen one where anyone's done it without. It looks lovely, doesn't it? Really happy with that. And finally, we come on to my FO, which I am wearing on my feet. You'll remember last time we talked about my Pond Hopper socks, which is the Easy Knits uh, Deeply Wicked colourway that on the ball looks like that. Fabulous, fabulous bright emerald and jadey and lime and lawn colours. Really, really lovely. Um, and that's how much I've got left, having completed my socks. <laughs> so let me take you through the story of these socks. Um, I'm traditionally a 72 stitch sock knitter for me. My gauge is getting looser, I talked about this last time. Um, it seems to be getting looser. Uh, these are knit on 2 mil, no, 2.25 mil needles, magic loop, which is what I always do, and these are cuff down socks. So this was the first one I made, and uh, it's it's got a standard wedge toe. It's, it's not from a pattern, it's just my own way of making a sock. There's some fluff on the bottom, I just want to get rid of that. Um, so heel flap, gusset. Heel flap worked on 32 stitches because it's only 64. 
Um, and then the gusset are taking us back down to 64 stitches, working till three centimeters before the end of the toe, doing the wedge toe with slip stitch pattern as well. Always do that on the toes. Kitchener graft to close. Now it's, it fits, it fits rather well, um, which surprised me. I thought it was gonna be really, really tight. Um, the only place that it is a little bit tight, which you'll see, if I can try and get this up, is across the instep, across here. The stitches are a little bit more open than I'd quite like them to be. Um, and it, the, the texture of the fabric actually changes. If I feel the fabric up here, it feels really nice and soft. Here it feels harder. And that's obviously because the, the yarn is under more tension. So it's not allowing its own natural bounce. And you can probably see sort of this stripe here where it just looks a little bit more open. So I thought, well, I hardly ever, when I'm just knitting ordinary socks, vanilla socks for myself, I hardly ever do a matching pair. I always sort of modify them. I'm always in pursuit of the perfect sock recipe. So this one, although it's still 64 stitches, um, what I've done is when I got to the heel flap, instead of just knitting 32 rows, I think I knitted 36, maybe we've gone to 38, I think it was just 36, which meant that the heel flap was longer, which meant that I picked up more stitches along the, uh, the side of the heel flap here, meaning that the circumference of this part, uh, going under the foot there and around the top, had more stitches in it than that sock. And I was hoping that, four more stitches, hoping that would be enough to allow that, that area of the sock to relax. Well, it sort of hasn't. Oddly, um, if I show you this sock, oh, it's hard there's no real light, you can still see it's quite, quite stretched out over there. Not as much. It's also meant that the gusset, oh, this is quite, it's quite athletic. Oh, I need... <laughs> I'm wearing myself out just trying to get the angles for my socks. This gusset is longer and this gusset, because I've had to decrease from a higher number down to get to uh, 64 again. Um, so, it, which I thought, having the longer gusset, would mean I'd need to knit fewer rows before I started turning the toe, uh, closing the toe, but I ended up knitting about the same. I don't know, it's all very, all very odd. But it has made me think, what then can I do to get more, more stitches around here without getting a really, really long heel flap? I worry that if I just continue to extend the heel flap, it'll all sort of like bend around and it just won't look right. So I've actually come up with another idea for, because at the moment, weirdly, I've got quite slender ankles anyway, but the 64 stitches is lovely around here until it gets to just below the ankle bone. And it's this part that needs the extra work, which is, if I'm looking at it, is just before the heel flap. The, the heel flap, you can't really see, yeah, you can. Heel flap starts here. The tight bit is this bit, which is just above it. So actually, extending the heel flap probably isn't gonna do the job. So therefore, I need to find a way of extending the stitch count, or upping the stitch count, just prior to starting the heel flap, which then means that I won't be doing the heel flap on half of the stitches because I'll have built up more. So I'll have more over the instep than I want on the heel flap because I want the integrity of the heel flap to stay the same. So this is where my head's going. I know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to share it with you now, but I've got my next pair of banana socks and I plan to do it. And I will show it to you when I've got something physically showable. Other than that, they do fit nicely. They're the right length, fluff. They are the right length. They're very, very nice. And they, uh, they feel great. I love the colors. John's done an amazing job. Um, this, the whole skein was 105 grams, which is fairly typical, I think, for, for John, one of John's Deeply Wicked skeins. Um, but you know, it's, it's sold as 100, but that's about 105. Um, I've got 27 grams left. So these were 78 grams 
for the flour. 78 grams for the pear. Um, and I think that's because of the lower stitch count, which is great. So there we are. That is my FO. And I'm going to wrap it up because we're. Uh, I thought that coming in sort of sooner than I normally do would mean I'd have less to talk about, but it seems my capacity for burbling on knows no bounds. Um, and I don't actually need anything to talk about. I can just talk. <laughs> I blame my mother, actually. I blame my mum. She's the biggest talker you've ever heard. And I think, as a child, A, I was learning from her, but not able to get a word in edgeways. So now that I can talk and I've got no one here stopping me because you're not even in the room with me at the moment, even though it feels like I'm in the room with you when you watch this. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'm just... I'm just going to talk and talk and talk unless I stop myself, which is what I'm going to do now. So uh, hopefully I'll see you with it in the next week. And uh, until then, while this podcast episode is a finished object, remember, life is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time. See you soon. Bye-bye.